So I need to thank uh, Professor Junidwala sir. He is instrumental for me to be here. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, without any further delays, please join me in welcoming Mr. Srijit Menon, Senior Trade and Investment Advisor and Lead Offshore Wind India for UK government. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you. That's deep. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much um, for, for having me here today. And it gives me an immense pleasure and honor uh, to be presenting um, um, in front of you all, especially after Dr. Balram has just presented, who, um, who's not just a friend or a colleague, but also someone who I look up to and as a mentor. And you, I, think, I think we really need to be putting our hands together and congratulating the National Institute of Wind Energy for bringing India to what it is right now and getting India ready for offshore wind. I mean, the tenders are coming out very soon. So please do join me in congratulating the National Institute of Wind Energy for the amount of work that it, it's not easy. Um, wind is definitely not an easy subject. Um, you've just heard from a perspective of what India is planning on doing on offshore wind. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, or share an experience in terms of uh, 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 an area in the world where offshore wind is already uh, been, uh, uh, been deployed quite vastly. Um, before I do that, just to kind of um, uh, settle down a couple of questions, why offshore wind uh, is important is, uh, uh, in my view, in terms of two aspects. One is energy security. We are in this geopolitical scenarios that we are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, energy, energy security is an, is an extremely important topic. And part of the wider energy mix of a country, offshore wind helps contribute and also helps expand that energy mix that you have um, uh, uh, working within a country. Uh, and this, this is where offshore wind plays a, such a crucial role. I mean, we are, now we are talking about floating offshore wind that Dr. Balraman was talking about. We're talking about co-production and co-location of hydrogen along with offshore wind. Um, and that's something that we, um, uh, we are exploring as well uh, in the UK via innovation uh, research and technological advancements. I'm not going to jump into detail because you've just heard from the experts. So I'll just very quickly run through um, a couple of things that we've, we've, we've been doing in the UK. Um, now, offshore wind in the UK is a pretty old subject. It's something that has been going on for nearly 15, 20 years. Um, the first offshore wind projects were, uh, as a matter of fact, deployed in 2000 uh, with a 2 megawatt, 3 megawatt uh, Vestas turbine. At the moment, the UK has got 12.71 gigawatts in operation uh, uh, around the UK. So that's different projects spread across the various devolved administrations. So that's Scotland, uh, England, and quite recently in, in Wales as well. Uh, in terms of ambition, it used to be 40 gigawatts in terms of um, the ambition for offshore wind by 2030. That's now increased to 50 gigawatts during the previous, sorry, previous, previous prime minister's um, um, uh, rain and uh, including five gigawatts of floating. And I'll come very quickly to floating uh, in just a second. Um, what's also important is how offshore wind contributes to the type of jobs that will be created in, in, in the industry. It is, even though technology is advancing, it is still an extremely uh, labor intensive uh, field in terms of manufacturing, in terms of the type of resources you will need to deploy in sea. Um, and the UK's Climate Change Committee estimates that we do need to have an installed capacity of 100 gigawatts uh, by 2050. It is also estimated that 50, 100 gigawatts of installed offshore wind capacity should be able to power every single house in the UK. So imagine all your houses in, in a country powered by offshore wind, and that's a unique situation to be in. Um, the whole point of offshore wind, or the whole industry is, is, was, is kind of controlled, go controlled, governed by something called BEZ, which is British Energy Security Strategy. Uh, and the whole point of BEZ is to help support the ambition of uh, pushing that 50 gigawatts uh, uh, ambition that the UK government has. Um, now, we spoke about India's ambitions, 30 gigawatts, 2030. Now, what will you need to help evacuate the power? There's a brilliant question from Professor Junjunwala as well. You will need to upgrade your grid infrastructure. Grid infrastructure for evacuation of power is extremely important. As a matter of fact, it's super critical. There is no point of um, uh, building offshore wind farms if you can't evacuate the power onto sea, uh, onto, on, onto shore. 
This is where a holistic approach was taken um, uh, by us through four key principles for offshore wind projects. One, cost to consumers, obviously. The other one is the impact to the environment. Um, and the impact to the environment part is extremely critical. You cannot build offshore wind farms in a manner that affects your reefs, your marine life, your fisheries. It has to be built in a manner that is sustainable. And going forward, we are seeing a lot more in terms of innovation. We're seeing a lot more in terms of technological advancements, in, especially in the terms of piling. So you can't have 300 tons of steel and concrete just going into the reefs. Um, this is where floating offshore wind is, is, is helping push the industry forward. And the other two areas is obviously deliverability and uh, operability and impact on local communities. Um, just a point on local communities, and, uh, and maybe one point I just want to highlight on India. There's this region in, uh, uh, in Tamil Nadu called Kanyakumari. Now, the, unique, the uniqueness of Kanyakumari is it's got the highest density of engineering colleges per, uh, 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 per person in any other uh, district in India. What we're also seeing is you have communities, which is fishing communities, and fishermen slash fisherwomen who have engineering degrees and seafaring experience because they go out to sea. Now think about offshore wind, what does that give you? It gives you engineers with seafaring experience who with a little bit of training on offshore wind turbines or, or, or operations and maintenance to become instant offshore wind technicians and turbines. That's a unique proposition that Tamil Nadu has to offer as well. Now, leasing in Scotland, I'll very quickly go through this. Um, you've seen from Dr. Balraman's slide as well, um, he was talking about India going into auction, uh, uh, putting out a tender for offshore wind. Uh, in the UK, we do a very similar format where we auction uh, uh, the seabed. The seabed is governed by two agencies. One is called the Crown Estate, and the other one, the Crown Estate Scotland. Um, once the seabed is leased to a developer, say Shell, for example, or BP, uh, the, the agency or the regulatory agency goes through something called an environmental assessment, which is the heart of getting those licenses. Um, the, and then those seabed allocations are done. It is then up to the developers to undertake those kind of lighter studies, uh, uh, resource assessment, environmental impact assessment, and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, what's interesting is this terminology called Scotwind. I don't know how many of you have heard this. Scotwind basically is the world's most advanced, technologically advanced, as well as the biggest large-scale commercial floating offshore wind tender to date. And this was recently floated in the UK, and uh, the winners were just announced in January for 25 gigawatts. And note this point here, yeah? 10 gigawatts fixed, but 15 gigawatts floating offshore wind. Normally you see the other way around, but for Scotwind, we've got 15 gigawatts of floating offshore wind that has been secured and given. And these projects were just recently announced. Now, the heart of the entire process in the UK is something called CFD. Uh, Dr. Balraman uh, beautifully mentioned how uh, cost is critical in the UK. And very soon you'll see a few numbers in pounds. Please don't compare pounds to INR because uh, it won't make sense uh, otherwise. But in terms of how those contracts are, contracts are laid out, we have something called CFD, which is a contract for differences. And the contract for differences is divided into four key parameters, basically to help support stability, uh, stability of income, which is basically you have a 25 to 35 year period for the, uh, for the contracts or the project timelines. Um, the designs have to be approved to be bankable. And these designs basically, especially on the contract, uh, will be a mixture of a private law contract along with a government contract, which makes it low risk uh, uh, investment. We use competition, which is, the, the basis for any tender to bring the, comp, uh, the prices down, and obviously cheap finance being uh, made available by the private industry as well as the government. Um, I'm gonna skip this because I've just spoken about that. Now, this is what I meant in terms of pricing, and Dr. Balraman mentioned how prices, when you're deploying something brand new in terms of technology, is gonna be high. The, one of the first uh, allocation rounds in the UK in terms of offshore wind, had a strike price of 119 pounds when the first offshore wind allocation was done. Now coming down, third round of allocations has come down to 41 uh, uh, pounds. Like I said, don't compare this to INR. However, the recent, the allocation that was run recently has gone down to 37 pounds. Now this historical data kind of shows you how technology advancement, innovation, as well as scalability pushes costs down. And that's what we've been seeing in the UK as well. 
And that's something you will see in India. Just because the initial cost, the COE, the cost of engineering is going to be high, does not mean you do not invest in the technology. It is going to be pushed down as long as you have those projects coming in. Um, the other thing I just wanted to very quickly talk about is AUMIS. And since I'm here at the IIT Madras Research Park, um, um, the one thing I did want to mention is research, innovation, and advancing technology is the heart of offshore wind. Um, uh, offshore wind turbines are, are, are becoming bigger and bigger. I mean, research organizations, industries, companies are not able to keep up with the size of the turbines that are increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is where AUMIS comes in. So AUMIS is basically the offshore wind manufacturing investment support scheme. Uh, it's 160 million pound funding that's been allocated by the UK government. It's towards uh, helping out in terms of manufacturing and infrastructure. But one angle of that is also also to support projects that are into research and innovation. So say you have a project that's targeting offshore wind, and you have a research project that you want to pilot or test. Reach out to us, and we can help support with the infrastructure for that, uh, either in India or the UK. Now, we spoke about the scale of offshore wind. Um, a colleague of mine put this together to kind of give you perception. Oh, oh, everyone's seen the London Eye, yeah? You know what the London Eye is. So that's 135 meters high. Then you have an eight megawatt turbine, typically, 195, but on offshore wind, right now you're seeing a 12 megawatt turbine, which is 260 meters high, which is just short of what the shard is. Now we are seeing bigger turbines coming out. We're seeing 15 megawatts, 16 megawatts is being tested in the UK at the moment at the offshore renewable energy catapult, which will then push that boundaries and go to 260, 280 meters. This is the scale you're talking about, yeah? So imagine flying into Chennai and looking out of your window on your flight, and you'll be able to see those offshore wind farms um, uh, out your window. That's the scale of these projects that we're talking about, um, uh, not just in the UK, but here in India as well. Um, now, just very quickly, in terms of floating offshore wind, this is evolution in technology. Floating offshore wind basically gets rid of one of the biggest challenges we have is drilling into the seabed. It gets rid of the requirement for these monopiling and instead uses uh, floating pontoons or floating platforms with mooring cables maximum that you'll have to uh, fix in. Scotwind, as I mentioned earlier, was announced and uh, a 15 gigawatt capacity round uh, for leasing uh, has been undertaken. Um, that project is right now being implemented in Scotland. Uh, Scotland is now home to the first floating offshore wind uh, farm called Highwind, which is a 30 megawatt project, uh, which is considered to be the largest off floating offshore wind farm at the moment before Kincardine comes online. Um, and all of these is only possible with supply chain and sector expertise. Uh, now I'll just link this up how, how this works with India. India has got all of these. It's got capability in terms of ports. It's got, capabil it's got capability in terms of maritime research. There's oil and gas expertise. There's subsea finance insurance. All of this club together brings in its own capabilities. And that's where we've been able to uh, work tremendously well. So this is where some of the areas where the UK specializes on and is working very closely with international partners. Uh, I mentioned about finance, it's early stage wind farm development, especially the design. Design is key. Design is key to everything. It'll be it's the design that delivers your bankability of the project, the operabil uh, operability as well as the deliverability of the project as well. Uh, construction support, O&M, cable operations design, pooling substation design, maritime port support, et cetera. So all these are areas that can only be achieved if there is joint industry partnerships and joint industry programs. The same thing applies to floating offshore wind, and this is something brand new. You can see on, on the right over there floating assets, and you've got different type of floating offshore wind uh, designs. You have something called tension legs with different kind of more cables. You've got barge, you've got semi-submersible, and you've got spa cable uh, floating offshore wind as well. This is another area of expertise where, where we've built through this kind of research partnerships with the industry and research organizations. Now, I keep stressing on the fact that it is key to the heart of offshore wind. It is the industry and the interde interdependence between the government, research organizations, and the, in, uh, 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 and the industry. Um, we've got uh, a, 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 an amazing center called the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Uh, they, they recently signed an uh, MOU with uh, the National Institute of Wind Energy to help support offshore wind uh, testing and demonstration programs here in India. Uh, the catapult is also home to the world's largest offshore wind blade testing facility and powertrain turbine testing facility. Imagine a 165, 180 meter blade being suspended from one end and dangling inside a warehouse. Uh, the forces being applied from that 
uh, testing is so much that they need to do underground dampeners to absorb the forces uh, in this small, tiny city called Blythe uh, in the UK. Um, and this is, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but this is basically a picture of how that testing facility looks like uh, in terms of wind blade testing. Uh, and this facility was just recently upgraded to meet 150 meter requirements, but guess what? The technology is advanced, so they now have to again invest and expand it a little bit more. So now they're now investing to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, uh, incorporate 200, 220 meter blades as well. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, I'm just very quickly, I just wanna to touch base on one topic, which is how we work with India and where we see a, a role for IIT Madras. Um, there are three levels of conversations that are happening with India. One, with the National Institute of Wind Energy, which is through the offshore renewable energy capital partnership on research and innovation, on testing. The other conversation that we have is a bilateral MOU between the government of India and government of the UK um, uh, to explore and support on uh, offshore wind uh, uh, analysis, tenders, those kind of areas. We have a technical assistance program that is currently running between both the governments. Uh, it's called Aspire and we're supporting India on its first tender as well. Where IIT Madras comes into the picture, uh, we've had a couple of conversations with, with, with Professor Jindinwell and Anson as well, is to explore partnerships, venues, and areas where we can build the future of offshore wind in terms of technology, in terms of innovation, in terms of anything that can bring and help bring the cost down. And this is where uh, 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 you know, uh, people from IIT Madras have a role to play. If there's any areas that you're interested in offshore wind, please do reach out. We're extremely delighted and helpful to be able to uh, uh, support you in that journey, either through platforms, infrastructure, or financing. So I will stop there just by saying one last thing. Um, offshore wind is exciting. It is the most exciting time uh, uh, for India right now. And together we can achieve a lot of things differently. So thank you very much, Anson and Professor Jindinwala.